it's Chris Mays from Armanino, and we're here again for another episode of Visions and Voices, where we talk to uh, people in the family office space about uh, issues inside of family offices. And today we have Joseph Viviano, who is a partner at McDermott, Will and Emery, who knows a thing or two about private trust companies. And Joseph, why don't why you give us a uh, background? Sure. Hey, thanks, Chris. So my background, I, I'm one of our partners in our private client uh, department at McDermott. And so anything and everything private client we handle, my background, I do a, a few things, but one of the things that I focus on, in addition to tax and state controversy litigation, is private trust company formation and operation. So at McDermott, we represent a, a very large number of wealthy families, and many of them have started for a while now, taking a, a big interest in private trust companies. And so I think by last count, our firm had, has either created or is currently working with the ministry uh, well over a hundred different private trust companies. Wow. In addition to, you know, um, I'm just not counting the regulated or retail trust companies that we work with. So, so what is a private trust company and how does it differ from a, a corporate trust company? Sure. So. In order to understand what a private trust company is, you kind of have to have a very brief background as to why you need one in, in the first place. And so at its core, a private trust company is an entity, usually almost always a limited liability company or a corporation. I think there's one, one or two states that allow partnerships, but I've never seen one set up as a partnership. And so you might say, okay, well, it's just an LLC or an entity. The distinction is this, is that it has special rights granted by the state, its licensure or to, and it doesn't have to be licensed, but to act as a fiduciary. And if you go back 100 years, 150 years, you know, historically corporations, and there wasn't LLCs back then, couldn't act as a trustee and exercise fiduciary powers. That changed in the early, early 1900s, but there was just still this prohibition on allowing just regular entities to do it. You had to be a bank, okay? Banks generally could exercise trust powers. What really happened was in, if you go back like Bessemer, you can look at its court filings. Bessemer was one of the first private trust companies in the world that was a bank and then it became for, for just the family members and then it started serving the public. The opposite has happened over the last 25 years or so, beginning in 2008, which is when these, these private trust companies really took off, when the IRS issued a notice of proposed rulemaking, basically saying, if you meet these requirements and have a private trust company, you're not gonna be subject to additional estate or gift or income tax. And after that, everyone said, okay, let's create a private trust company because of what a private trust company allows you to do. It allows you to create your own fiduciary, your own mini bank to serve members of your family. Some states allow two or three families to be served, but that's it. And you can have a, an entity now that's going to serve in perpetuity, because entities don't die, without paying all the expense of a corporate fiduciary, when you're talking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, 30 basis points adds up pretty quickly. Yeah. And you're able to perpetuate control within that structure. You can pick who's going to make distribution decisions, who's going to make investment decisions, you know, who's going to, you know, be the officers of the organization. So, and, and that surprisingly can be very helpful for a lot of really, really old trusts that don't have you know, modern appointment and removal provisions in the trust instruments. So it's very, very hard to structure an old trust the way you might structure a new one without decanting or modifying the trust, which carries its own risks. But you can have that same flexibility by inserting a private trust company. That's why they've become so popular. I, I joked that you know, for wealthy families, the private trust company is becoming the new revocable trust. Like it's just kind of part of the estate plan. Yeah, yeah. So 
Now, you said certain states require these uh, private trust companies to be registered or they're regulated, and then other states, they're not required to be regulated. Could you maybe delve into that a little bit? Sure. And I think before I get too deep into the weeds, let's talk about the difference between the two. So a regulated trust company or a licensed trust company, depending on the state that you're dealing with, is very much like a bank. You have to file an application with the appropriate financial division regulator in the state. You've got to disclose, uh, and, and the type of regulation varies from state to state. Some states regulate more heavily than others. And you have to disclose who your officers or directors are gonna be, who the family members are gonna be. You have to meet minimum capitalization requirements, which can range from, I think, the lowest is 200,000 up to $2 million. So that's the amount that the, the entity, the PTC has to have. Uh, and then uh, all your officers and directors have to undergo a background check. They get fingerprinted for, uh, for the FBI. And then most importantly, there is a periodic auditing conducted by the state regulator to make sure that the books and activities of the trust company are proper. With an unregulated trust company, you don't have any of that. You, you literally, typically the process in most states is, and some don't require this, you send a notice to the state regular regulator informing them that the trust company has been created and it is going to be able to serve members of this specific family. And that's it. You never deal with the regulator again. The only regulation, and it's not even regulation, is just to keep your annual state filings with the local secretary of state. And so, you know, your next question, Chris, I don't want to, steal your thunder but like why would anyone create a regulated trust company well i yeah and, it, and if you could add kind of maybe give us a, examples of states that are regulated versus states that are uh i guess less regulated that that would be yeah. apropos as well yeah so i'll just give you two examples because like there are a handful of states that are kind of the go-to states to creating these things we were talking before the podcast chris about nevada i have a lot of private trust companies in nevada in fact that's probably one of my go-to states you know other really popular states are south dakota wyoming those are kind of like the three old and true ones that everyone looks out for and, Actually, my partner, Elise, drafted the Wyoming Trust Company Act, um, and it's, it's very good. But every state kind of has some bells and whistles. Then there's other states that are like newcomers on the block that are, are proving to be pretty popular for a variety of reasons. And the two big ones there are Tennessee and Florida. And so just to give you the juxtaposition, Nevada offers you the menu of options. You can be regulated or unregulated. South Dakota, you have to be regulated. In, in other states, you know, match one of those profiles. And so those are the options that you have. But if you, I mean, okay, so you, you've got the the, di the possibility of dynastic trusts in South Dakota. You, you don't have that in Nevada. You have some other restrictions in Nevada that are can be kind of burdensome for family offices. I mean. Are, have the newcomers learned from those two jurisdictions and incorporated any of the, the, the you know, the, the best thinking on uh, trust companies in their, their instance of, 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 of the laws? Yeah, and so I can I can speak to this on some personal level. So at least you're after the Wyoming Private Trust Company. For the last two years, I've been working on the Michigan Private Trust Company Act. I drafted that. And so I have a very good insight into how the sausage gets made here. And you know, to, to, on some level, you might say it's a race to the bottom. I mean, that's the term that's been yeah. used for income tax rates, right? For, for to have our, the least restrictive set of legislation that gives, gives private trust companies and trusts the most flexibility and the most uh, benefits, it, we, we, it, that's what you mean by the bottom, right? Yeah, right, right. And I, I, I don't actually mean it's a bad thing. I just you know, turn a phrase that's been used before. And so, so you might expect that for competition among the states to attract private trust company business. Yeah. And certainly that is true with respect to Nevada, South Dakota, and Wyoming. Like those are the states that are 
very active in tweaking their legislation, trying to approve. They have regulatory support from the government to, to make these states attractive and attract the business. The experience I had in Michigan, and I've seen it kind of play out, and I wasn't involved in drafting the Florida or Tennessee Act, but like there are aspects of those acts that we don't like. And, and so it's not a, a pure race to the bottom, as you might think. In, in Michigan's case, like, you know, there's a lot of, there's a number of persons who are interested in, in the legislation that say, no, we don't, we just don't think this is a good idea from either a regulatory perspective or a fiduciary perspective. So we don't want to include that in our version of the act. Now, all these acts will have a number of things in common. Some of them are more developed in detail than others. You know, there's aspects of the Florida Act that I don't particularly like, but it is very well organized and outlined. And and if you look at and compare the Florida Act to the Nevada Act, you can like copy and paste some of the provisions. Like like literally the states are borrowing from each other. So there's no uniform act, but there is a lot of poor commonalities. Right. Now the fact that you okay, so you don't have in most of these jurisdictions you don't have any state income tax. That's not true for Michigan. So how does that like how does that factor into the, the calculus? It's a it's a great point and, and there's a precedent for this. So Colorado had a private trust company act that they cr it created and it lasted like all of a year or two before they repealed that because Colorado income tax rates were so high, nobody used it. Michigan and states like Michigan, their, their income tax structure for trust residency is based on the residency of the settler at the time the trust was created. So, okay. so, so if you, for those type of states, private trust company legislation is attractive for two reasons. Number one, you can import out-of-state trust business, right? So like if you don't have a, if you have a trust that was became irrevocable by someone who was residing anywhere else other than Michigan, Michigan is not going to tax that trust anyway. So you can import business. Number two, all of these states have wealthy residents more than others and wealthy families. And so part of the legislation is to define how out-of-state trust companies will act in Michigan. So you might be administering the, the, you might have a Nevada private trust company or a South Dakota private trust company, but you still need rules for what they can and can't do in Michigan. Right, 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 right. So, so you know, stepping back a little bit to talk about the the, the benefits to these wealthy families, and I, 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 I loved your analogy that they're or they're. That, they're becoming the new rev trust for 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 family offices, and and I, I would I would say just you know we we look at the Secretary of State filings as I mentioned you know pre pre recording and and we just we we've seen a ballooning of the you know the the, the company names that are end in PTC private trust company or they they, they say explicitly private trust company in in the jurisdictions that you 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 mentioned so we we know they're growing but what like i know privacy is a one of the big benefits i also know that you know a lot of a lot of my clients trust can't fit into a corporate trustee because the corporate trustee for you know post i guess post dodd frank post sarbanes oxley they 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 have all these corporate restrictions now from a liability perspective where you know some of my clients they, they, they just can't fit into the requirements for the trust and so they're 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 thinking that private trust companies are a better option for them because they have more flexibility in terms of what the provisions of the trust can be and they don't have to conform to these these corporate trustees but if, if you could dive into the benefits i, I guess these would be kind of the, the not the privacy and the non-tax benefits of private trust companies, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, so I'll start with your examples. It certainly has, I believe, over the last 10 years, gotten more difficult to deal with with large national banks. And like, look, I have a lot of large national bank clients. That they're great and, and they do. But the reality is, is because they are first and foremost worried about getting 
you know, sued for something or having some regulatory violation and they have better processes in place, it is more difficult to onboard a trust, especially trusts that hold concentrated positions. And even more so if those are non-marketable positions, very, very, very hard. And it takes more time to effectuate decisions because of the layers of bureaucracy in a large, large bank. And so decision-making is slower. There's often way more papering. And I'm sure you've probably seen it, Chris, like you can't, you know, make a distribution without getting, you know, an indemnification and a release for everything that's happened from the beginning of time. And right. it's, you know, it's just a cumbersome process. You know, there are other benefits and we talk about those, but it, one of the points I want to make is a lot of times well-educated national banks or local banks, which almost all the national banks are, love private trust companies because they can offload all the fiduciary risk, or at least most of it, to the people are running the show, and then they can do all the back office stuff that really they're kind of equipped to do to begin with, uh, better than most private trust companies, actually. They can handle the custody, they can handle the reporting, they can handle the, they can do all their banking stuff, and then uh, for that, so a lot of them like that, are happy to work with private trust companies. In terms of the other benefits, and we were touching on this to begin with, a lot of it is control. You get to pick the structure and the succession plan forever. I mean, I was having a call yesterday with a, a family. They're considering creating their third or fourth private trust company for a variety of reasons. And so part of the thinking that goes in this, okay, you know, what eligibility requirements do I want the descendants to have before they can serve? Do I want to involve independence, which is often a good idea, non-family members to run this thing that have professional qualifications? And, and how do I uh, to make sure that those people are being picked correctly? So a lot of it, a lot of the benefits go into governance. And then I did mention earlier about this uh, cost savings. And I mean, it could be gigantic a gigantic cost savings, especially because what most private trust companies ultimately do, they don't have employees, although we have a number of private trust companies that do, what they do is they enter into a services agreement with the family office that's already like employed and doing this stuff anyway. So the, the additional cost for doing this is, is not that material compared to the, the cost savings. So there are, I think if I had to boil it down into three, you know, bullet points, it's cost savings, uh, it's it's control, and it's governance. And, and I guess the fourth would be speed and flexibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then maybe a little bit on privacy too. I guess if you're a regulated private trust company and you've got to report up to a state regulator, you're not getting as much of the benefit of privacy. But, but then again, you know, I, I know inside of a the large public trust companies, for lack of a better term, that or banks, you know, as you said, lots of people have to t touch every single distribution. So you're, at least in, in terms of the number of people that have information relative to the trust, is is, is going to be exponentially larger. But I think private. Privacy is actually a selling point. I think for private trust companies, is not a detriment. So. Yes, there is information that gets disclosed to state regulators, but I'll use Nevada as an example, like the auditing process. Let's, let's start there and work back. Like you don't, you could, if you wanted to, you, you know, Nevada gives you an option. You can either use a state auditor who gets char who charges 60 bucks an hour and to look at the stuff, or you can hire a CPA firm and do it privately. So you don't, they don't have to investigate and look at everything that the government doesn't. Now, I'll leave it to you as to decide and the listeners decide which one of those people is going to take a closer look at your books and records, but it's a pretty uh, intrusive process, typically, even if you, especially if you go with the, the government auditor. And the big thing to keep in mind is in every state that I'm aware of that has a, a regulated private trust company option, it is, it is not, it is a crime to disclose information that has been submitted to the state regulator regarding the private trust company. I, I think, it, it, I'm trying to remember, it's either like a high misdemeanor or a felony with jail time. Oh, wow. And, and so it's not, you know, 
you know, we, we've had a lot of clients, I'm sure you have Chris, who recently been victimized by the little John, you know. Yeah, just, we could do a whole podcast episode yeah. on that. <laughs> so, so, I mean, they, there's, there's no certainty, right? Like always yeah. someone could say, you know, it's worth five years in prison for me to publicize this information. But you have to keep in mind that there's not, there's, less information being disclosed to the regulator from the private trust companies, a lot less than on your income tax returns. And so it's always a risk, but it's mostly protected. The other thing is, is that a lot of these states have very strict, the states that want to attract the trust business have good private trust company statutes. They also typically have other good trust statutes. And like give you an example, like again in Nevada, they recently, Nevada recently amended its ceiling statute. So now you can file, if you have to go to court, you can go to court and file things under seal if it includes anything related to trust whatsoever. You don't even have to file a motion and ask permission first, you can just do it. So these states generally are very protective of privacy. They understand they have to be in order to attract the business and the competition among states. And and in, in all the time we've been doing this, I have we haven't seen any leaks from a, a private trust company regarding a private trust company. And a private trust company does give you some, I think the main detriment to using a private trust company though is eventually for some families, there will be maybe a, uh, an SEC disclosure, 10K, something that is going to list the name of the, the company, a trustee of whatever trust, or it's going to be acting as manager of whatever company that has some association with a family. And so even if you, you know, if instead of creating the Chris Mays private trust company, you call it like, the Apple Orange private trust company, eventually the Apple Orange private trust company could become associated with the Maze family. family. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, hey, we were talking a little bit before, you know, there was some optimism, I think, probably six to nine months ago that private trust companies would be a way of alleviating some of the disclosure risks on, on, on our new Corporate Transparency Act. And you... You kind of, before we start recording, tamp down the, the expectation there, but I'd be interested to hear because some some of my clients have thought, oh, if I'm if I'm therefore right, if, if I'm in a state which has a regulated private trust company statute, my disclosure doesn't have to go any further than the private trust company. And and therefore I'm not sitting on some government database. And, you know, we have clients that have real concerns. I'm, I, I, you know, I've got a client that there was some infidelity in the family and you know there there's a pool of money that was set aside they're just things that they don't want you know the other family members or the public or anything to 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 know about and you know and, and some of these things are are just they're 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 they're, they're so tightly held you know and, and for legitimate reasons i mean we're not, i don't have any clients that i that that, that i know about that are you know using privacy to assert the law, you know, or assert the tax code, but, 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 but they're, you know, they're personal family issues. And, and this country was founded on the, at least on some perspective of the right to privacy. And so, you know, these, these vehicles are, 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 are used to, to, to kind of uphold that right. Yeah. And I, I, I you know, we're, again, going back to the little John Lynch litigation, just to give you an antidote, like we asked our clients, all of them who received those notices, do you want to, you know, sue anybody for do for this disclosure? Virtually every single one of them said no. Why would I want to then like become a more public face, spread my privacy? Like, so everybody uh, typically values privacy, some more than others, for sure. But I mean, even ordinary people that aren't wealthy, I think would say, I don't want my information. And, and that's, you can also see the general public perception of that. That's why we have, you know, I think 20 something states now have state privacy, uh, privacy laws uh, to protect that. And so on the CPA, some, you know, a lot of people, there's, we still have a lot of unanswered questions as to what is and isn't allowed for the CPA because the regulatory guidance and the FAQ by FinCEN is just not that comprehensive yet. And that will get worked out. What, what we do know right now for private trust companies, the CPA is that 
it is not, you know, you have a regulated private trust company and lo and behold, everything in the structure is now exempt from reporting. That is not the rule. Okay. You have to be a regulated private trust company. What that does is that exempts you from reporting the regulated private trust company and its control structures. Everything within the private trust company, like like what I'd be more specific, you don't, you can't avoid reporting the trust that own interest in entities and the entities that are owned by the trust administered by the private trust company just because you have a regulated private trust company, which is what everyone would love if that were the case, but it's not. And I, you know, if anyone's interested in, in reading more about this, my partner, Elise McGee, um, a great article um, that's available online. It was published by Bloomberg Tax that goes into this in a lot more detail. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, shoot. So it's not going to be the, the, the panacea that, that some of my clients thought it would be. So what are the typical steps in creating a private trust company. I mean, how does how does a family go about, you know, getting one set up or assessing the ROI on it? Kind of how, how do you get started? Yeah, I had never had a client that I've either pitched or that I've responded to a request to create a private trust company that has said, hey, show me the cost benefits of this. It's almost always been the I mean, that's like an add on. It's always been like control flexibility, speed, governance, and succession. That's what I care about. And, and from that perspective, that's typically how we start. You know, the process is, okay, what, you know, usually we'll prepare it. We'll have some conversations. We'll, have, you know, talk about the issues involved with private trust company. And private trust company governance for tax reason is usually split into at least two different decision makers distribution or discretionary decisions and investment decisions, but you can slice and dice that even more as much as you want. And so we usually start with a, a framework that works for most people. And then we give them options and talk about their situation. So we'll start with a term sheet and then we'll start working on the governance. And the governance for most private trust companies consists of three documents and it could be more than that. Usually you have your, your articles of organization or incorporation. Most of our private trust companies are LLCs. Typically we wouldn't use a corporation unless there was a, the most common reason for using a corporation is because some trust instruments say it has to be not a corporate trustee, but literally a corporation. And so to avoid this qualification, sometimes we've created a, a corporation. Then you have either your bylaws or your operating agreement. Then you also have, for most of our families, you have a separate policies and procedures manual. And then one of the really unique things about private trust companies is because we're so concerned with the, the tax, we call them, to prevent imputation of powers held by the fiduciary to the decision makers. We usually have uh, something called a, a special type of trust, an ownership trust that owns the entire structure. We've done it, you know, without ownership trust uh, in a variety of ways. Those are kind of unique circumstances, but you, know, you could have a purpose trust instead of a regular trust. You could have, yeah, you know, I've, I've had a situation where the operating company actually owns the private trust company. So there are many different permutations of this, but once you've set up your governance, so to speak, you then complete your applications. If you're going to be registered and file them with the local regulator. Uh, if you're not going to be regulated, then it's really just shooting out the notice and you're going to be done. A lot of times for speed, it's not uncommon for a tr private trust company to start off as unregulated and just send the notice. Then while the application is still being processed, you know, you, you can exercise fiduciary powers. And then once the application is processed by the regulator, we can become a regulated trust company. So it's, it's kind of a speed issue. And then you were saying that most of the families or are not operating these after, after formation, the, the subsequent operations are, it's typically outsourced either to a, a brokerage or the family office itself, but but then the family members retain the the, the fiduciary positions in, in in most cases, or or, or do they actually have professional 
fiduciaries that come in and, and uh, those trustee services directly to the, the individual trust. So how does that work? Yeah, it, it depends. So, I mean, on a simple level, let's just think that a private trust, let's ignore the entity wrapper and just say this is a, like essentially there might be five to 10 people who are officers, directors, or committee members of a private trust company. Could be more if it's a really big family, maybe 20. But they're ultimately the decision makers. And, you know, like wealthy family members or sophisticated business or experienced you know, lawyers, accountants who serve within these structures are, are not going to have the time to prepare all the documents for running the private trust company, documenting decisions, resolutions, drafting resolutions, drafting minutes, anything that goes into just regular good corporate governance. They're not gonna wanna prepare trust accountings they're not going to prepare, you know, other financial statements. They're not going to go. In, they're not going to essentially do anything that goes into the mechanics of actually fulfilling the fiduciary duties, other than evaluating information and making decisions. Decisions. And right. so all all of that is typically done, like you said, Chris, by a third party service provider. Some of it's done by the law firms. Some of it is done, you know, by the family office. Some of it, you know, is done by your broker or whoever your investment, you know, person is. Um, and so all the back office stuff is usually performed by a service group. That being said, there are some very large you know, families that have their suite employees within a private trust company. That does, I mean, it's not unheard of. It's not even that unusual for very large uh, to have full staffs at the PTC level in addition to their family office. Now there's gonna be an overlap of services, right? Like sometimes you'll go to the family office for some things and so other times you'll go to the, stay within the PTC structure. But you know, it's, PTCs are kind of like family offices. You know, if you've seen one, you, you've seen one. Yeah, okay. So in terms of, so, so, so if you're making investment decisions, are they operating with, inside of the family office exemption from an SEC standpoint or how like how is that whole thing managed so so the family office exemption yes very important for all our unregulated private trust companies typically they're all structured i haven't seen one that's not structured to qualify for the family office exemption and in fact if you look at the definitions of the f people who are eligible to receive services from a family trust company, it's often, you know, similar to the family office exemption. And, and so you have state law tracking, you know, federal law on that. It's less important for our regulated private trust companies because as a, as a you know, we often take the position that those are our banks and therefore they are not subject to the limitations of the family office rule. So there, you know, your restrictions on who you can have as a client at a private trust company really are based on state law, not so much the SEC. Okay. So what, what considerations or, or what things that we haven't discussed should families take into consideration before contemplating a private trust company? I think the big point is, I mean, are, are you are you happy with you know your current you know situation? Do you have a, you know if if you look forward 50 years from now, are you confident that the governance structure within your current trust is going to be adequately provided for? I mean, I think that's probably the the threshold question that gets people really thinking about this and why we want an entity that's the leader is is governance and control or are you unhappy with it now could you improve upon it once if you answer the either of those questions yes then all the other benefits we're talking about are extra right like now you know we, we've got cost savings now we've got speed and flexibility and all of that but it really it really starts with with control and you know, making sure you've got a system in place that you can be more confident uh, is going to effectuate your goals for leaving all this wealth in very complicated structures to begin with. Yeah, 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 it makes sense. So, okay, 
Well, are there is there any other advice or insights you would uh, with both wealth owners or family office executives who might be considering a, a private trust company? Yeah, just one word of uh, caution because we we're very positive about private trust companies, and and they really are great. And if you know your clients haven't considered one, they probably should at least think about it. Um, it doesn't make sense for everyone, but for a lot of families, it does. The caveat I would be like, it's it's not a like a set it and forget it thing, right? It's not like you create it once and you're done. It's it's like a plant. It's like any good planting. You have to water it. You have to watch it. You have to update it to take into account changes in the law, like the CPA or or anything else. And and you've got to you know keep your records and you know really make sure you have a good back office system to manage it. Because the one thing that I've seen. And certainly it's it's more common with trust companies that have been created by, and we were talking about this, you know, Chris, when you refer to people to, for family office work, like Joe Schmoes, you know, they, they create it and then it just sits there. There's no record keeping, there's nothing that's being done. And if there is an issue, you know, five, 10 years from now, like there's gonna, there's nothing to back up what's been done. And, and it's gonna really call into question the integrity of the, the, the private trust company or the, or the taxation of the private trust company. Yeah. So the yeah. main caveat is like, you know, think about one if you have one, if you don't have, if you already do have one, have you looked at your governance in the last 10 years to make sure you're following the policies that you spent a lot of money and time thinking about to set up? Because a lot of times I've seen that that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. Hey, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to come on and, and, and talk to us about private trust companies. And this was this was super helpful. I, I think we should have scheduled an hour because I didn't get <laughs> halfway through my questions. <laughs> um, but again, I really appreciate your time. Very, very nice to meet you and look forward to uh, working with you in the future. Great, Chris. Thanks for having me.